Welcome to the last day of the Literacy Symposium and this session, the role of executive skills in literacy development. My name is Stacey Cherney and I am joined by my colleague, Lisa Bola. We are excited to facilitate this session for everyone. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping items to review. You can access the presenter handouts for this session and the bio and the conference schedule on the Patton website. And Lisa will provide that for you in the chat. As a reminder, this session will be recorded and is 75 minutes in length, which includes a 15 minute question and answer period. To access closed captioning, click the icon CC live transcript on the control panel. If you experience technology difficulties, please go to the technical support guide area um, above the schedule on the symposium page. Because this is a webinar, microphones have been muted and your video feature has been turned off. We would love for you to tweet out or share out on social media all that you are learning from the Literacy Symposium. The hashtag for the symposium is hashtag patentlit2022. And Lisa will put that in the chat as well. And now we are so excited to have Dr. Peg Dawson present for you. Okay, thank you. So I'm happy to be here. I enjoyed yesterday's session. Um, and I'm sure today will be uh, equally fun. Uh, so quick background about myself. My background is school psychology. I started out working in the public schools for about 16 years, and then I joined my colleague and ultimately my co-author, a guy named Dr. Guerre or Dick Guerre. Uh, he and I uh, both did our doctoral work at the University of Virginia, although we were there at different times, um, but then went on to uh, work together in a, in a clinic setting, which started out as a private practice and eventually merged with a local community mental health center, which is a, a Seacoast Mental Health Center in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, I want to, there's a lot I want to cover. Uh, I will say that. Uh, this is interesting stuff. I can spend an hour talking about executive skills, so I can spend five days talking about executive skills. It's a little daunting to only spend an hour, um, but I, I got the sense yesterday that people got something out of it, so we'll give it our best shot. I'm going to start with a couple of introductory uh, comments. I've made. I've added a slide for, to your handouts because there is something I realized I, I wanted to include yesterday. I went to it went through it orally, but it's just helpful to have a slide. So my slides may look a little different from yours. Uh, but let's start out by talking about here are three key concepts about executive skills. I think this these are important things that everybody needs to understand. Uh, first of all, what they are. So they are brain-based skills that are managed out of the frontal lobes of the brain, which is the part of the brain right behind the forehead. And they take a minimum of 25 years to reach full maturation. Uh, and that's in typically developing kids with kids with ADHD or neurodevelopmental learning dis or learning disorders. Um, it may take longer than that. Um, so that's that's one. The next uh, concept to understand is until these skills are fully mature, it's our job as parents, teachers, and adults who work with kids to act as surrogate frontal lobes for our kids. Okay, we basically lend them our frontal lobes. And in my experience, we do this pretty naturally when kids are young. And then somewhere around middle school, things go horribly wrong. And I will give you the evidence to support that statement in a bit. But here's the explanation. Because by the time kids hit middle school, our expectations for brain development and executive skill development specifically is way up here. Actual brain development is down here. So there's this gap between what we expect kids to do at that age and what their brains are comfortable doing. Uh, and that can cause all kinds of problems. There is a third point though, because we can't act as surrogate frontal lobes for kids forever, because then we'd have to follow them around for the rest of our lives, their lives or our lives. Uh, and so the third point is this, whoops, how did I skip that? Um, that it's also our job as parents, teachers, and adults who work with kids to ensure that they grow their own executive skills. And if that's not happening naturally, then it's our job to explicitly teach them and give kids lots and lots of opportunity to practice. So let me just give you a, 
a, a little more uh, background about the field of executive skills. And, and the main point I wanna make is there's not a lot of consensus um, in the field, which is typical of any big psychological or educational issue. Think about how we teach kids how to read. Uh, that certainly has a lot of controversy. It's, but the, the, the lack of consensus starts with a name. The more common name is actually executive functions. And if you wanna know what the research says, uh, type executive functions into an academic search engine. Um, my colleague Dick and I chose to call them executive skills though for a very specific reason. And that was we wanted the emphasis to be on skills. You know, a skill implies whatever level you're at, you can get better at it. Function doesn't give me that same sense. When I think about function, I think, okay, it means use. And then I start picturing refrigerators or copy machines. Um, some people combine the two and call them executive function skills. I'm happy with that because that keeps skills in the title. There's also not a lot of consensus about how many skills we're talking about. Now, the range I've seen is from one to 33. You know, one of the early researchers on executive skills said there's really only one executive skill. We call it the central executive. You know, the opposite end of the extreme, people like Russ Barkley, who's I consider the world's leading expert on ADHD, and George McCloskey talk about 32 or 33 different skills. Um, obviously, if you've got that bigger range, then there's also no consensus about what the specific skills are. So here was the position that Dick and I took when we first started looking at these. We started with this question of all the skills that are out there that people are talking about, which ones um, are the most critical for school success? And could we define a pool of those that didn't go overboard? Because if I'm asking people to teach skills, I can't ask anybody to teach 33 skills. So could we find some middle ground? So we basically settled on 11 skills. Uh, and recently I've been dividing those, those 11 skills into two groups, foundational skills and advanced skills. So foundational skills are the ones that develop first. Uh, and I've listed them in the order in which we think they emerge developmentally starting from shortly after birth. Uh, it's somewhat speculative. No one's tried to create a research protocol to answer in what order actually. And some of these skills are emerging almost simultaneously, but this is our best guess based on our reading of the research. Now with the advanced skills, it, the, the list there is more arbitrary to be perfectly honest, except for metacognition. We think metacognition is the last executive skill to emerge in any kind of mature form. Um, and of all the, the terms you can see listed on that slide, metacognition is the one that confuses people the most. All the other ones, you can look at it, you can probably figure out what it means just by reading the label. Metacognition is a little more confusing. I mean, the throwaway definition for metacognition is, oh, it's thinking about thinking, which I'm not even sure what that means. So here's how I think about metacognition. And I'm trying to come at it from a developmental perspective because at the point when metacognition kicks in, kids' brains change pretty dramatically. Um, so here's how I think of metacognition. I think of it as the awareness that you have thoughts and that you can use those thoughts to solve problems, understand the world, make sense out of things. Now, obviously kids have thoughts from a very early age, right? First they develop language and all their thoughts are out loud. Uh, and then it, it starts being internalized. In fact, we call it internalized speech. Uh, and then eventually it goes underground completely. So we have to guess at what they're thinking. Um, but that's different from the awareness that you have thoughts and you can use those thoughts as tools. Once they acquire that understanding, then you'll see a bump in all those other advanced skills because now they can use their thoughts to plan and prioritize, to develop organizational schemes, to manage time and to set goals. Now, when I'm working with parents or teachers of elementary age kids, my advice to them is focus on the foundational skills because those are the first skills to emerge. And if you put in place interventions at that during those years, uh, and keep them in place long enough, and that's actually a pretty important piece of all this, you will see progress. Even, if, even with kids who struggle with any of these foundational skills, you will see progress across elementary school. It's not that uh, it, you ignore the advanced skills, you certainly model them, you shape them, you talk to kids about how we need to make a plan or how we need to get organized. You just don't expect kids to be particularly good at those skills by the time they leave elementary school. Now, when I'm talking with middle school parents or teachers, what I tell them is, if you think that by middle school, kids should be proficient in those advanced skills, you must be pretty frustrated. Because for most kids, 
most of these skills at that age are just emerging. And what we know about emerging skills is they look great one day and lousy the next. You know, it's like learning to ride a bike. You don't go from being not being able to ride a bike at all to being able to ride three miles fluidly without falling down. Now, there's a lot of falling down that goes into learning to ride a bike, and some practice sessions look better than others. Even into ninth and 10th grade, for many kids, they're still feeling their way with these advanced skills. And again, I'm talking about typically developing kids, not kids with any kind of educational disability. Um, and so that, oh, one other point I wanna make, and that is if you work with older kids at the middle or high school level and they have significant executive skill challenges, start with the foundational skills again, because those are the building blocks for the later advanced skills. And as you're working on those foundational skills, you're paving the way for them to develop the advanced skills as well. So let me show you, um, uh, since the picture is worth a thousand words, I wanna show you a, a series of MRI scans that show how the brain develops. It really makes that case for how late these skills develop. These were MRI scans taken by a neuroscientist named Paul Thompson at UCLA. It was quite a few years ago that he took these. Um, and he brought the same kids in year after year, starting at age four, ending at age 21. Unfortunately, he did not go to age 25, um, stopped it at 21, took an MRI scan of their brain and then created a composite. So I'm gonna take you pretty quickly from age four to age 21. And I want you to see how late in the process, the frontal lobes uh, mature. Now, the key to understanding these scans is, first of all, the frontal lobes, look at the right-hand image because that's the best one to watch. Uh, the top of that right-hand image, those are the frontal lobes. Um, and the key to understanding this is the color. So an immature brain is red and orange. A mature brain is blue and purple. So you can see at age four, there's nothing that's purple. Um, what's blue is mostly around sensory input because the sensory systems are the first systems to, to mature in the brain. If you look at the frontal lobe, it is clearly the most immature part of the brain, and a lot of it is red and orange, um, and there's just a tiny bit of blue. So again, I'm going to take you pretty quickly to age 21, and here's one other thing to understand about this. The brain matures from back to front, okay? The back part of the brain is the most primitive part of the brain. The front is the most advanced part of the brain, and if you look at that image, the right-hand image, you're looking down uh, on the brain. So the back of the brain is in the bottom of that image and the, the front of the brain is in the top. You will see the blue start at the bottom and travel up. Okay, so here goes. Okay, so there we are at age 21. There's a lot of purple on that brain, but not so much in the frontal lobes. And in fact, there's still a fair amount of green in the frontal lobes. And the text there says the 21 year old brain is mostly mature, but the areas of green show that even at the threshold of legal adulthood, there is still room for increases in emotional maturity and decision-making skills, which will come in the next few years. Okay, I started in this whole presentation by talking about how tough middle school is. Let me give you a sense for why that is. I'm gonna bring you back to age 13, there we are, because that's middle school. Look at the middle school brain, look at the frontal lobes. It's mostly green. There's a lot less red and orange, so progress has been made. But when I look at the blue in the frontal lobes at age 13, I'm not seeing a whole lot more blue than I saw at age four. Think of what happens at middle school. Uh, think of what we ask kids to plan, organize, keep track of, remember. As soon as kids start changing classes, every teacher has a different set of expectations about how homework is to be done, how projects are to be completed, how tests are to be taken, how notebooks are to be kept, um, how notes are to be taken. Uh, many schools use block scheduling and kids have to keep track of A days and B days. Uh, many schools use rotating schedules. So first period on Monday, a second period on Tuesday, et cetera. In fact, I've worked with several schools in the last few years that had seven day rotating schedules. So first period on Monday changes from week to week. These kids often have complicated after school schedules and many of them are living in two homes. And we get upset because they forget something. I'm always preaching patience to parents and teachers and middle school kids. Okay, so let's, let's go on. So here's what I'm gonna do now. I am going to, you get to watch that one more time. 
I'm going to go through our 11 ex executive skills one after another, just to make sure we understand um, what the terms refer to, what the skills that we're talking about are. Um, I may give you, I, I think I can in several cases, give you a sense of here's what we focus on for an intervention. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, this is described in much more detail in our books. But after I go through our 11 skills, then I'm going to look at literacy, both acquisition. I'm going to look at reading acquisition, what executive skills kids need for that, and for reading comprehension, what executive skills need for that, and to give you a sense of how executive skills factor into literacy development and reading comprehension. Okay, so the first executive skill uh, to develop is um, response inhibition. So this is basically the ability to stop and think before you say or do something. Uh, according to Russ Barkley, who's done a lot of the early developmental um, research on this, response inhibition emerges somewhere around six months of age. You know, it's going to look very uh, rudimentary at that age because what a six-month-old has available to it is respond, don't respond. It will look differently in a three-year-old, differently in a 13-year-old. And as kids acquire language, they use language to support response inhibition. Uh, so if you hear a toddler saying to herself, no, don't do that, because she's heard a parent say that to her, she's using language to inhibit a response. Barclay maintains this is the most critical skill. Uh, and so the strategy we use to teach response inhibition, and it's most relevant at, the, at preschool, but I think it bears repeating at any age, we teach wait and stop. If you can get wait and stop into kids, that's basically response inhibition. Okay, so that's the first skill. Let's go on to, oops, uh, working memory is the next skill. So this is the ability to hold information in memory while performing complex tasks. You know, if I wanna stress this out in a testing situation, the easiest way to do that is to ask a kid a multi-step math problem, ask them to solve it and present it to them orally and ask them to solve it in their head. So, Eight squirrels are on the ground, six squirrels leave, three other squirrels arrive. You can tell I live in a place with a lot of squirrels. <laughs> How many squirrels are on the ground now? Uh, if I ask a kid that question, and I just made it up, but it's very similar to one you'd find on an IQ test. If I ask a child that question and they did the first step and gave me that as their answer, my immediate thought is, what's going on with working memory? Have they forgotten what the question is asking? Have they forgotten what step they're on? The question also requires you to hold on the onto the precise numbers in the question and to pull from long-term memory into working memory, two math procedures, addition and subtraction. So there's a huge working memory load in that one question. There's really nothing that we ask kids to do that doesn't require working memory though. I mean, even sending them to their bedroom to retrieve a sweatshirt, a one-step direction, they still have to remember why they're there when they get there. Um, so, and, and when I've done work with schools for kids with dyslexia or more complex learning disabilities, what those teachers tell me, and there's a lot of research to support this, is that working memory is the weakest skill for that population of kids. So I think what that means is these kids are probably gonna need cues, prompts, and reminders um, for far longer than we think we should have to give them. Um, and whenever possible, so this is the strategy, we need to give kids visual cues and not just verbal cues. Because if it's verbal cues, it's either in one ear or out the other, or it's in one ear, but they can't retrieve it when it's there. Um, so that's that's the, the thought in terms of working memory. Okay, let's go on to the next executive skill, which is emotional control. So this is the ability to manage your emotions in order basically to get stuff done. Um, whether it's schoolwork or anything else. Um, and, and we know that this has a huge impact on kids' ability to learn. If you are flooded with negative emotions, um, then you're gonna have a hard time paying attention to the lesson, remembering it and retrieving it later. This may be the most um, complicated skill to acquire because although the brain is hardwired for emotional control to develop, uh, it's actually a complex dance between the internal hardwiring of the brain and the uh, environment in which the infant finds itself. So an infant who's in the best position to develop good emotional control is one who by seven months of age at the latest has a consistent, reliable caregiver 
who responds to his or her physical and emotional needs in an appropriate and timely fashion. And there's one additional ingredient, that caregiver manages their own emotions well. Because there's a mirroring process that goes on in terms of emotional control. In fact, we call them mirror, mirror neurons. Kids learn to manage their emotions by watching how those around them manage theirs. At its most extreme, I think about kids with reactive attachment disorder. Uh, and the ones I see in my clinical practice that carry that diagnosis are kids very often who enter the foster care system really early so they don't have a consistent caregiver or spend the first few years of life in a Romanian or Russian orphanage where they're sharing multiple caregivers with, with multiple other kids. Unfortunately, it's emotional control that's probably most likely to be impacted by that situation. And when emotional control goes off the rails, it's often difficult to correct because for those kids, it's all about survival and they have a fairly skewed idea about what survival means. That's a pretty uh, extreme diagnosis. Most kids don't carry it, thank God. But I also think about emotional control when I think about kids with learning disabilities. Um, why? Because no matter how well taught they are, kids with learning disabilities are gonna experience more failure going through school than typically developing kids. And they have to have some way of managing the emotions associated with that failure. The shame, embarrassment, humiliation, anger, irritation, frustration. Um, so one of the strategies we use for emotional control is we teach kids to talk to themselves. What could you say to yourself to manage that anger, that irritation, or that frustration? Um, and this is what underlies cognitive behavior therapy, which is a very effective form of therapy um, for both kids and adults. It's based on the premise that our feelings are not caused by external events. They're caused by what we tell ourselves about those external events. And if we can reframe the situation, then we may be able to handle it better. Okay, the next executive skill is flexibility. Now, I didn't say this earlier, um, but my interest in executive skills arose once I started working in a clinic setting, I was seeing a lot of kids referred for um, attention disorders. Uh, and kids with ADHD have all kinds of executive skill challenges. Flexibility is not necessarily a challenge for those kids. Very often it's a strength because these are go with the flow kinds of kids. But I'm sure you can think of kids who struggle with flexibility. I mean, the most common one, if I ask an audience, so what kids do you know that struggle with flexibility? The first answer I get is kids on the autism spectrum. And that is absolutely true. That rigid and flexible thinking is sort of a critical feature of autism spectrum disorder. But I think about flexibility as an executive skill that sometimes lies beneath the radar. We see the behavior, we don't realize it started with inflexibility. I mean, so let's say you have trouble dealing with unexpected changes in plans. What happens when they occur? Your anxiety level rises. We see the anxiety. We didn't realize that it started with inflexibility. Um, or oppositional defiant disorder. I mean, when I think about those kids, I'm thinking about power struggles and control issues, and they're refusing to do what we've asked. But if you step back and say, what was the trigger? What led that kid to refuse to do what we've asked? Very often it was because someone was asking him to be more flexible than he was capable of being. And all he had was his behavior as a way of saying, I can't do that. The good news is flexibility can be taught. And there are some nice curricula out there designed to do that. Michelle Garcia Winner's social thinking curriculum is probably the most uh, well-known. Uh, I particularly like the Unstuck and on Target curriculum. And if you Google Unstuck and on Target, you'll get to their website. It started out as a school-based curriculum, but they've now created a lot of materials, including an online course for parents on how to handle inflexible kids. So those are the kinds of resources you might wanna take a look at. Um, if that's if that's if you've got kids with that kind of challenge, the next executive skill is sustained attention. Okay, so this one is a critical feature of an attention disorder. Um, there's a key phrase on our definition, though, which I've come to appreciate over the years. So the definition is the capacity to maintain attention to a situation or task. The key phrase is in spite of distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. You know, I don't know how many kids I've seen over the years, their parents have been nudged into my office by a pediatrician or a teacher because someone thinks their kid has attention problems. And they will say to me, my kid can't have ADD. He can play video games for hours. <laughs> well, video games don't involve distractibility, fatigue, or boredom. So what I tell parents is it's not that kids with ADD can't pay attention. It's that they have trouble making themselves pay attention. That's not going to show up with video games. Where are parents going to see it? 
three places, homework, chores, boring daily routines. Um, in school, teachers often see it like with independent seat work. Uh, and with kids with dyslexia or learning disabilities, this gets a little tricky. I've often been asked to see kids, oh, maybe around fourth or fifth grade, where the, the issue is, is this, does this child have an attention disorder? Uh, and I need to sort out, is that just what, what happens when dyslexia is not being effectively treated by fourth or fifth grade? Because for those kids, reading is incredibly effortful and they run out of steam or they get exhausted or they just get tired of doing that kind of work. So um, going back in time to look at what were, the, were their attention problems in preschool, kindergarten, first grade helps me sort that out. In terms of interventions for sustained attention, there, there are a lot of good ones, um, but I always start with, you gotta start with where the kid is at. You know, if the kid has an attention span of 10 minutes and you give them a 30 minute task to do, it's not gonna go well. So can you break tasks down into smaller pieces? Can you build in breaks? Can you challenge a kid? You know, if you get the first uh, five math problems on this worksheet, right, you don't have to do the rest of them. All of that will shorten the task for kids. Um, okay, the next executive skill is task initiation. So this is the easiest way to explain this one. I'm sure you know what it is. It's the opposite of procrastination. Um, and this is my favorite skill to talk about because I am firmly convinced that this is the last and hardest skill to acquire. Uh, I think many adults struggle with this skill. Um, and that's based on my clinical, my personal experience. But um, if you look at the literature, you get confirmation there. If you type procrastination into an academic search engine, you will be hit with over 5,000 citations. I did it a few months ago. Um, so obviously people recognize procrastination is a problem. They're trying to figure out what to do about it. Uh, I haven't read all of those articles, but I have read a few. And uh, the one that really jumped out at me was one that gave a developmental trajectory for procrastination. And here's what it said. And remember, procrastination is a bad thing. Procrastination increases until the mid to late 20s and decreases gradually after that. Surveys of college students have shown that 86% of college students say that procrastination is a problem for them and almost half of them say it affects their grades. Uh, so when I read that article, I thought, man, we have got to figure out how to teach task initiation. If we could do that, we could increase college graduation rates. We could decrease the amount of time kids are spending in college and save parents thousands of dollars. So I've done a lot of thinking about how to teach task initiation. I finally come up with um, a starting point. This won't work in all cases, but I've had, I used it very effectively with my own kids and I've, I've passed the idea along to others who've reported back that it works really well. Here's what you do. To teach task initiation, you ask kids to make a plan with a start time. And then you make sure they start the plan at the time they said they were gonna start it. So for parents, this would mean like getting up on Saturday morning, saying to your kid, so what's your plan for cleaning up your bedroom? If the kid says, I'll do it right after lunch, then your job as a parent is to be there right after lunch to make sure your child starts cleaning his bedroom. Why is that important? because the brain learns by association. Uh, so the more you can glue together two events, event A, event B, state of start time, actual start time over and over again, then event A will trigger event B. It's a variation on Pavlov's dog, which is maybe the most famous psychology experiment ever done. Uh, that Russian psychologist Pavlov rang a bell, presented meat to a dog and the dog salivated. And after a while, all Pavlov had to do was ring the bell and the dog salivated because he anticipated that the meat was coming. Um, so state is start time, actual start time. Give it a shot. There are ways you can do it in school. Sometimes teachers will ask kids to make plans for their homework and then check back with them. You, did you start when you said you were gonna start? We have a, we have a form in, in some of our books that actually you can, either parents or teachers could use to help kids make homework plans that involve uh, uh, starting, whoops, I'm sorry, um, starting, starting tasks on time. Um, okay, those are the first six foundational skills, right? These, this is where to start um, with almost all kids. Um, it's the basic building blocks for the skills that are coming later. But also, it's good to start with the first six skills because they lend themselves to easier interventions than the later skills. It's a whole lot easier to teach a kid to make a plan with a start time than it is to teach him to make a plan, which is the next executive skill. 
So, um, because planning is way more complicated, right? You have to figure out what you're planning, sort of the purpose of it. You have to figure out what materials do you need in order to carry out your plan. You need to figure out the steps to carry out your plan. You need to make sure those are in the right order. You need to figure out what's important, what's not important. That's the prioritizing piece. All of that goes into planning. Uh, prioritizing is just a subcomponent of planning, but it's such a huge piece that we keep it in our title. Um, it's also sort of like flexibility. It's a piece that sometimes lies beneath the radar. Um, that you don't realize that someone's having trouble planning because they're having trouble prioritizing. Um, I read this a few years ago. I was working with a 15-year-old um, who was referred for some learning issues. And I have a sort of semi-structured interview that I go through with kids where I ask them about various aspects of school performance to figure out where the breakdown occurs, you know, at least from their perspective. So I said to this kid, tell me about note-taking in lecture classes. How does that go for you? And he said, ah, oh, I have the worst time with that. The teacher is talking on and on. I have no idea what's important and what's not important. So I don't know what to write down in my notes. And then a couple of minutes later, I said, tell me about studying for tests. He said, I have, a, I have a hard time with that too. I've got all this material in front of me to study for the test, but I don't know what's going to be on the test because I don't know what the teacher thinks is important. Um, so I don't know where to put my study time. So both of those are examples of problems of prioritizing. You can also see it very easily in, in any kind of um, writing assignment uh, in terms of kids who have trouble figuring out what, what are the essential components and where can they avoid going into too much detail? I mean, those kinds of things. Um, but going back to the broader umbrella of planning, when I think about planning in a school context, I immediately think about long-term projects because that's sort of where the rubber meets the road um, with this particular skill. And I decided a long time ago that there's a mismatch between when teachers start assigning long-term projects and when we can expect kids to independently plan those long-term projects. And I think teachers understand that. So what do they do? They do the planning for kids. They break this project down into subtasks and timelines and interim deadlines, and they walk kids through the project, which I think is totally developmentally appropriate. Um, however, it fails to take advantage of the opportunity to teach planning. So whenever I'm talking with teachers, I'm saying to them, rather than doing the planning for kids, could you do the planning with kids? And we have a long-term project planning form in, in several of our books, which, which could be used for that purpose to just walk kids through the process of planning a project. Okay, so the next uh, skill is organization. All right, so there's a key uh, word in my definition. So I'm gonna read it so in your own mind. Think about what do you think the key word is? The ability to create and maintain systems to keep track of information or materials. Um, when I ask a live audience what the key word is, I get different answers. Some say ability, some say, say create, some say systems. Well, this is my weakest skill. And I can tell you, I am great at creating systems of organization because every four weeks I have to come up with another system for keeping my study clean because the last one didn't work. So clearly the word is maintain. Uh, and if you have ever tried to turn a disorganized kid into an organized kid, you know this is a long-term labor-intensive process. Because it's not just a question of creating a system for the, for the child and handing it off to them and expecting them to run with it. Or even better, because everybody's organizational system is somewhat idiosyncratic, saying to a kid, you know what, your backpack's a mess. You can't find your homework when you need to do it, and you can't find it when you need to hand it in. So let's take your backpack apart and figure out a, a system that will work for you, a way where you can track materials down easily that's organized. You still can't hand it off to the kid and expect them to run with it. And I finally figured out why that is. Uh, and here's the reason, because at any single point in time, it is faster not to use an organizational system than to use an organizational system. I mean, it's way faster to take that science worksheet and stuff it in your backpack wherever than it is to take out the science notebook, open that up, take out the incomplete homework folder, open that up, put everything neatly in and put it neatly back in the backpack. Yeah, it may take longer in the long run, but in the moment, it's faster not to use that kind of system. Now, I will say one other thing about organization, which is something I've learned over the years, uh, and that is that although we've listed this as one of the advanced skills, I've discovered there are people out there who seem to be naturally organized. 
Uh, and so very often, if I'm speaking to a live audience, I'll say to the audience, how many of you in here think of yourselves as being pretty organized? And about 30 to 40% typically raise their hand at that point. And then I say to them, how far back do you remember being that way? And they say, forever, as far back as I can remember. Those are the most common answers, I guess. So that tells me that there are some people who are just naturally organized. <laughs> you know, I, I don't ask the audience, how many of you in, the, in, in this audience are, uh, are disorganized and how far back do you remember being that way? <laughs> um, as, as someone who is disorganized, I have vivid memories of my mother getting on my case about my messy bedroom when I was in preschool. She stayed on my case all the way through high school. I went to college. I got married immediately after college and my husband started getting on my case about my messy bedroom. So if you think that getting on one's case is a good intervention for organization, I assure you it isn't. Um, and that just one other quick thing about organization, what I find is that par parents and kids often have different executive skills profiles, uh, both because it's developmentally immature with kids, but also because um, they have different natural inclinations. And one of the worst combinations I've run across is a highly organized parent with a slob of a kid, um, because that, that kid's messiness really grates on that parent. So with those parents, I'm always saying, start really small. You know, rather than expecting your kid to clean up his bedroom every night spotlessly, start with a small space. You know, can he keep the desk clear where he does his homework? And can that be the last thing he does before he goes to bed, just clears off the space where he does his homework? So that's my thought there. Next executive skill is time management. Now, here's where we start seeing the earlier executive skills embedded in the later executive skills, because time management is basically task initiation, sustained attention, and planning with one additional element that's unique to time management, and that is time estimation, the ability to estimate how long it takes to do something. Uh, and in my experience, the people with poor time management skills is the time estimation piece that doesn't work well. Uh, and when I'm working with kids, what I find is more often than not, they uh, are underestimating how long an effortful task is going to take, and then they leave it to the last minute and run out of time, or if they're in high school or college, they're pulling all-nighters. Um, I do see a subset of kids, though, who do the opposite. They overestimate how long a task is going to take, and then they don't want to start it because in their mind, it's going to take forever. I realized this several years ago when I was working with a third grader um, whose mom told me every night they fought about math homework long knockdown drag out fights about math homework. The kid could do math, that wasn't the issue. He hated to do the homework. And it finally occurred to the mother, they were spending more time fighting about the homework than it would actually take him to do it. So she said to her son, how long do you think this math worksheet's gonna take? And the kid said, oh, it's gonna take at least an hour, which is a long time in the life of an eight-year-old. But the mom said, are you sure? Let's see if that's the case. They wrote down the time he started the homework, the time he finished it, subtracted, it was 10 minutes. The kid was stunned. He had no idea he could get the math homework done that quickly. And time estimation <clears throat> is a skill that can be taught. So the next night, the mom could have said to the kid, remember last night you thought the math was going to take an hour and it only took 10 minutes? Look at this worksheet. What do you think? Let's take a guess on how long you think it'll take and we'll see if you're right. Because as kids practice time estimation, they learn to calibrate time better. Um, and that can save all sorts of headaches down the road. Okay, the next executive skill is goal-directed persistence. This is, in our scheme, this is a very late developing skill. Uh, I mean, you can see signs of goal-directed persistence in younger kids. I mean, a four-year-old who's putting a very difficult puzzle together and they're not gonna stop until they get it all done. That would be goal-directed persistence at that age. We're talking about longer term goals in, in our definition, we basically lifted from, from Russ Barkley again. Um, we're not talking about goals you can accomplish by lunchtime. We're talking about, so what do you hope to accomplish this summer? Or what are your plans for the first marking period? Or what do you wanna do after high school? Um, and with that in mind, now you can see how the, uh, all, most of the earlier developing executive skills factor in here, because you can't just set a goal and forget about it. You have to remember it. So there's working memory. You have to have a plan for achieving the goal. So there's planning. You have to start and finish the plan. So there's task initiation and sustained attention. You have to resist the temptation to do all those other fun things you'd rather be doing than working on your goal. So there's response inhibition. And if that's irritating or annoying to you, then you also have to manage your emotions. This is the killer skill for middle school parents. 
because I've discovered that middle school parents expect their kids to have this skill by middle school and in my experience, most don't. I know that's their expectation because when they come into my office, they say to me things like, doesn't my kid realize that how he's doing in eighth grade is gonna affect what college he gets into in four years? <laughs> of course, the short answer to that is no. They don't have that time kind of time horizon. They haven't lived long enough to understand what four years and to, is and to picture four years out. And they don't know what college is. So they, they're, you're asking them to picture something in the distance that's very amorphous to them, undefinable. Um, and unfortunately, the, the mistake many parents make, and I made it when my kids were, were that age, in terms of encouraging goal-directed persistence, I was looking at it through this very narrow window of academic performance. Uh, so I was leaning on my kids to try to make the honor roll or to bring their grades up. They weren't there yet. And many kids aren't. So we always recommend in terms of encouraging goal-directed persistence, um, you start with where the kid is at. Um, so if they, if, they, if they're not, you start with some, I'm sorry, you start with something the kid wants um, and, rather than something you want. Uh, if they're into sports, you might have them set a sports goal. Um, a couple of things that many high school students want, both of which require uh, goal-directed persistence. They often want their driver's license and they want a job. You know, both of those have multiple steps. They take time to achieve and you have to persist with them. Uh, but one of my favorite ways of encouraging goal-directed persistence, because you can start this with younger kids, is having kids save up money for something that they want that costs more than their weekly allowance. Because then you can talk with them about how you're going to earn the money. How are you going to save the money? How are you going to resist the temptation to spend smaller amounts of money on something else before you saved up for what you really want? So all of those, those are the basic elements of goal-directed persistence. And then finally, metacognition. So I gave you one definition before. I often talk about it as being able to see the big picture, uh, being able to put the pieces of the puzzle together, connect the dots. It's hard to talk about metacognition without using a metaphor, which is apt because meta is the same in both. If I were going to use psychological terms, um, I would talk about self-awareness. Uh, and self-awareness incorporates things like self-monitoring and self-evaluation. I think it was a little voice in your head that's saying, okay, how am I doing on this project? Have I read the rubric? Do I have I included everything I need? How am I doing for time? Am I gonna be able to finish it by the deadline? Uh, and then maybe when you get the project back and the grade wasn't what you wanted, you might say to yourself, well, that wasn't what I was expecting. What did I do? What could I do differently the next time in order to bring my grade up? All of that is metacognition. And the other piece I like to um, connect metacognition to, it's metacognition is basically what you need to do abstract thinking. Um, to read between the lines, right? Uh, and this, this is a very late developing skill. And let me just cite one research article that helps that helped me understand that. It was a study that looked at kids' ability to write a good summary. And they looked at kids of different ages. And what they found was only 14% of fifth graders can write a good summary. Only 28% of seventh graders. Only 36% of 10th graders can write a good summary. And only 50% of college students and 85% of adults. So there are some adults who never fully uh, get metacognition. Now you can teach kids to write summaries. Although I've had a number of fifth and sixth grade teachers tell me that the younger the kid is, the harder it is to teach it because they don't have much metacognition. But what those slowly climbing percentages tell you is this is how slowly metacognition develops in the absence of direct instruction. Um, and summarizing is just one example of a common uh, academic task we ask kids to do that requires metacognition. Uh, when the core curriculum first came out and I started looking through the standards, well, one of the first things I did was I typed, I typed executive skills into the search engine to see if there's any teaching of executive skills included in the core curriculum. And no, of course there aren't. But if you look at the individual standards, you can see that they're, they're built on an infrastructure of executive skills. And one of the things that concerned me was when I looked at, for instance, the reading comprehension standards, you know, starting from second grade at least, they were asking kids to read between the lines. They were asking kids to understand what they were reading on a level that required some degree of metacognition. And I became worried then that are we expecting kids to do something that their brains aren't ready to do yet? 
Um, and when that happens, that puts tremendous pressure on teachers to figure out how to teach um, that kind of reading comprehension, uh, which ends up being a source of frustration to parents, teachers, and kids alike. Okay, so there's the introduction to executive skills, and now I want to connect it to reading. Um, and I have, to, I have to tell you that this is my best guess. I mean, I've, I've got a great book that I refer to. You have the reference to it at the very, in the very last slide. Um, and that was by Kelly Cartwright. It's a great source of information that connects uh, reading comprehension to executive skills. Um, but I wanted to break it into two groups because there's reading acquisition, there's, there's learning to read, and there's reading to learn, right, as we often say. So there are different skills acquired for e required for each. So I've broken down my chart into two columns. The first is learning to read or reading acquisition. And the second is reading to learn or reading comprehension. So let's look at those two, and I go skill by skill. So the executive skill of response inhibition. Um, at the reading acquisition stage, good readers sit still, they resist distractions, they don't jump to conclusions when they encounter an unfamiliar word. They take their time to sound it out or, or to figure it out based on context. Um, in terms of reading comprehension, Good readers choose the correct meaning of a word and they follow a plot by focusing on relevant information. Uh, and both of those require response inhibition because your first impulse in either case may not be accurate. Uh, and also, you know, it's, an inter it's interesting to think about distractibility. Is that sustained attention or is that response inhibition? There are elements of both in there, but I think it, a lot of it is response inhibition. So I, I've talked with so many, uh, actually college students or adults with ADHD who say that reading a book is the most frustrating thing they can think of because their mind keeps wandering because maybe they read a sentence and that reminds them of something else and then they're off. I mean, I've had some adults tell me they couldn't read a book until they started taking stimulant medication, which enabled them to focus. Uh, okay, working memory. So at the reading acquisition stage, good readers, when sounding out words, can recall the sequence of sounds. They hold new words in mind when they see them again in the text. Uh, they require fewer repetitions to commit sight words to memory, and they learn phonics, and uh, you have to learn them before you can apply them, they learn phonics rules. I've done a lot of testing, of, uh, uh, reading testing of kids over the years, and all of those are issues. I see kids who they start sounding out the word, and by the time they got the last two letters, they've forgotten what the first letters were. That's working memory. Or they're reading a page that has the same word over and over again. Maybe they miss it the first time. Maybe you feed them that word. They can't retrieve it the next time. The next time they're, they're, they see it on the page, which may be two lines later. All oh, that's working memory. Um, and we do know that kids with dyslexia require many, many, many more repetitions before words become, uh, and before words reach automaticity. You know, so they're sight words that they recognize instantly. Uh, at, in terms of reading comprehension, how does working memory fit in? Well, Kelly Cartwright had a, had a great summary of this, so I've quoted her here. She says, at the very least, good comprehenders must decode print, choose between multiple meanings of words, employ comprehension strategies and access prior knowledge, all the while building and holding a mental model of text meaning. So basically they've got multiple things going on at the same time and they have to hold on to all of that. So uh, kids with weak working memory are really gonna struggle with comprehension. Emotional control. At the reading acquisition stage, uh, Good readers are able to manage their emotions in order to attend to the lesson and understand and retain the critical information being taught. Um, in terms of reading comprehension, it's pretty much the same thing. They have to manage their emotions in order to attend to a text, understand it, and retain the critical information. Uh, over the years, um, what I've discovered is um, that the kids with dyslexia who are in best shape I mean, I've tested high school kids with dyslexia, some of whom have walked out of the room when I suggested that the next thing we were gonna do is do some reading. And other kids were able to plow through even though it was difficult for them. The critical difference between those two kids, 
the first kid had trouble him managing his emotions and the second kid had somehow managed to hold on to goal-directed persistence even when reading was challenging for him. So he was able to keep his emotions in check. Uh, okay, moving on to flexibility. Um, here at the reading acquisition stage, when decoding words, kids are able to shift strategies when the first attempt fails. So if they, they sound out a word and they realize that doesn't fit with the sentence, um, they will, they can, they, they can, and maybe it breaks phonics rules and that's why they sounded out according to phonics rules, but that word doesn't fit. So they were able to shift strategies and try something else. They also understand that the same letters have different sounds and they can make adjustments as needed. Uh, in terms of reading comprehension, Good readers are able to shift interpretation based on new information in the text, and they can select the correct meaning from multiple meaning words based on the text. We often ask kids to make predictions when they're reading for reading comprehension. Inflexible kids, unfortunately, sometimes make the wrong prediction, and then they stick with that wrong prediction. So they ignore information in the text that doesn't match their prediction. They're unable to shift their prediction based on new information. Uh, okay. Sustained attention. Uh, and it, this is one where I, I found some typos. So your handout has typos. I was able to change it. it. At the reading acquisition stage, kids, good readers can persist with reading tasks, even when they're challenging or not fun. So they know they got to stick with it. Um, at, in terms of reading comprehension, same thing. They can sustain attention to the reading material in order to follow the narrative or the plot. Uh, and again, when they're drifting in and out, it, as many kids with ADHD do, they have trouble um, holding on to the, the key information in the narrative of the plot. <clears throat> okay, task initiation. Uh, and interestingly enough, pretty similar to sustained attention. In fact, kids with attention disorders, the executive skills they struggle with the most are task initiation, sustained attention, and response inhibition. So um, if a kid has ADHD, and perhaps they also have dyslexia, it's so hard for them to make themselves start a task. So, But good readers at the reading acquisition stage can initiate reading tasks even when they're challenging or not fun. I can remember, and I'm like 72, so this goes back a long ways. I was in first grade. Um, I had a book that was well beyond my reading level, but I would just read the pages and looking for words that I knew. So that's good sustained attention. I was willing to do a task that was relatively meaningless because I couldn't follow the plot line just to pick out words that I knew. Um, again, with good, with, at the reading comprehension level, good readers can again initiate reading tasks even when they're challenging or not fun. Um, okay, so those are the basic foundational skills. Now my premise is those are the skills that are particularly relevant for reading acquisition. I'm not as sure that the advanced skills are as necessary for reading comprehension. Although I ran this chart by uh, a, a reading specialist whom I really respect in, in Ohio, uh, who's published in the field, although he's a, he's a practitioner. Um, and he, he wrote back and was able to give me ways that, that even reading acquisition require advanced skills. I'm gonna give you my model because I'm, I'm more sure of it. I mean, he talks about organization in terms of kids need to understand how words are organized on the page. Yeah, I get that. But I think for the most part, as we're moving through the, the, um, the reading acquisition phase, organization plays less of a role. However, the reading comprehension phase, organization is pretty important because good readers understand both sentence structure and narrative structure uh, as shown by organized retelling of stories. Uh, they, are also, they also are able to use organization cues and text to aid comprehension. So if they're reading nonfiction, they're looking at headings, they're looking at bolded words, they're, they're looking at the diagrams on the page and, and connecting it to the text. All of that re requires some degree of organization. Uh, planning and prioritizing, again, at the reading acquisition stage, I don't think there's a lot of planning involved. Basically, teachers are doing the, the planning for kids, <laughs> telling kids, okay, here's what we're going to spend um, this reading group doing. We're going to do first do this, then do this. We're not asking uh, at the reading acquisition stage kids to use a whole lot of planning. 
Um, however, the reading comprehension uh, level, good readers preview the text to understand the sequence of information, to access prior knowledge, and to understand the level of effort required to comprehend the text. So before they start reading, they do some overview of what they're reading to understand um, what they have to do in order to get through the text successfully. Uh, and with time management, again, we're not asking kids to manage their own time uh, at the reading acquisition stage. Uh, but with reading comprehension, this is important because they have to estimate how much time to allocate to a reading or writing task and plan accordingly. So knowing something about how complicated text requires more time to understand than simple text. Um, or if you're one of those people that enjoys reading novels, you, you don't have to spend as much time reading a, a, a fiction piece as opposed to a nonfiction piece if that's not your preferred reading activity. Um, and then goal-directed persistence. Again, we're setting the goals for kids. <laughs> um, although you can tell by me reading through that book and finding that goal-directed persistence was probably pretty strong with me even from a young age because I wanted to master reading. Um, but it, again, that's atypical. Uh, but at the with reading comprehension, good readers are able to set a goal for reading and making a plan to achieve the goal. Uh, and then finally, metacognition. And now we're going back. Metacognition is required at, at, even at the reading acquisition level because a lot of what early reading involves is, is identifying letter patterns, seeing how those patterns um, appear, and language structures that make word identification easier. So when we can start make connect, making connections and see patterns between words and text, that is that requires a level of metacognition. And that is certainly it's going to be easier for kids who have that level of metacognition than for kids who don't. But it's really important for reading comprehension um, because we need good readers connect text to prior knowledge. They gauge their understanding of the text. So they're doing that self-monitoring as they're going along. Wait, did I just understand what that paragraph said? Um, they ask relevant questions based on what they're reading or their understanding of what they're reading. They make predictions. All of that is metacognition. And then just, again, there's this whole level. This is the abstract thinking again. They can identify characters, motives, feelings, internal states to explain their actions. They can make abstract inferences to understand at a deeper level. Um, so in, in fact, when I think about the, the role that all of these executive skills play in reading acquisition, uh, if I were gonna identify the ones that I thought were most important, um, interestingly enough, even at the reading acquisition phase, I would say, well, working memory is critical for both, absolutely critical for both. And although the metacognition required it for reading acquisition is less than is required for reading comprehension, that's actually a pretty important skill as well. Um, and it's certainly, essential to reading comprehension. Okay, and then my last page, as you will see here, just gives some references. Um, Kelly Cartwright's book, Executive Skills and Reading Comprehension, is um, a goldmine of material. She explains how uh, executive skills factor into reading comprehension. It's full of strategies. Um, our book, uh, Dawson and Greer, Executive Skills in Children and Adolescents, A Practical Guide to Assessment and Intervention. If you're a parent, I would recommend Smart But Scattered or Smart But Scattered Teens. Um, and then this last book, for those of you who are elementary school teachers, Lori Faith, um, Carol Bush and myself, but Lori Faith and Carol Bush did the, did the heavy lifting here. Um, they've written a great book about how to embed executive skills into the classroom, executive function skills in the classroom, over, overcoming barriers and building strategies. Um, mostly geared towards elementary level. I mean, Lori Faith, when I met her, was a second grade teacher. She's gone on to get a doctor, a PhD, and she's now heading a research center at the University of Toronto. So all around executive skills. So she understands this stuff both at, at the teaching level and also at the research level. So check out that book. I highly recommend it.